Hello lads and ladies, Brad the Guitologist here. In a recent video, I shared the story of a reel-to-reel -reel tape that found its way into my possession a couple years back. It had been unearthed quite by accident at an estate sale in a small town in Iowa in the 1980s and contained lost interviews of some of the biggest music stars of the 20th century. In the first video of this series, we listened to an interview of the late great Carl Perkins, writer of Blue Suede Shoes and original Sun recording artist. If you have not seen that video, I encourage you to click the link in the upper right hand corner of your screen and check it out first. In this video, we will listen to the lost interview of the man in black himself, Johnny Cash. But let me warn you, what you're about to hear may not conform to your current idea of what Johnny was all about. The modern caricature of Cash as a friend to the hippie or anti-war dove with claws gets thoroughly challenged here. A little backstory for you that did not see the first video of this series. The interviews on this tape, which to my knowledge have not been heard by anyone in over 50 years, were recorded backstage at a June 1967 concert in Seattle, Washington by Bobby Wooten, a Seattle radio DJ. Bobby, like Johnny, was a native of Arkansas. He had a deep timbre to his voice and a southern Arkansas drawl. So the similarities of his voice to Johnny's are uncanny, to the point that at times it can be difficult telling whether it's Bobby or Johnny talking. At the time of this recording, Bobby's son was serving in Vietnam, and the interviews were made to be broadcast for the troops on Armed Forces Radio in Vietnam. America was in the midst of a political divide over the war, and many protests on the home front included the burning of U.S. flags and vitriol toward returning U.S. soldiers. The interview covers these topics, and Johnny pulls no punches in his comments on anti-war protesters. This is not Johnny Cash as he was presented in the recent Netflix documentary, Tricky Dick and the Man in Black. In this documentary, which culminates with Johnny's 1970 White House performance, he is depicted as walking an apolitical line and not taking sides or speaking out on social upheavals of the day until after his 1969 concert tour of Vietnam, whereafter he became an opponent of the war. Yes, he tried. He tried to walk the line. People will say, oh, he tried to have it both ways. Johnny Cash doesn't get involved in that. He is not political. He does not take a stand. This interview challenges that notion that Cash was a fence sitter on the subject of the war, which is something the Tricky Dick documentary intentionally or unintentionally whitewashed. Also of interest in this interview, Johnny talks at length about his recent drug arrest and his affinity for one June Carter, who was not yet his wife. I believe this to be an important document of a side of Johnny Cash that rarely is seen today and is an important and rare piece of music history. So without further ado, here's the long lost 1967 interview with Johnny Cash by Seattle DJ Bobby Wooten. I'll bet you there isn't a person listening to me right now that has not heard the name Johnny Cash, that has not listened to some of the Johnny Cash records has been produced over the last 10 or 15 years. I've had the pleasure of knowing him for some time and I'm very pleased to have him here at our microphone now because that's exactly what we're going to talk about is Johnny Cash. Johnny, as they do in all interviews, briefly tell us where you were born and raised and that sort of thing. Well, I was born in southwest Arkansas, February 26, 1932 in a cotton patch. You kidding me? You weren't born in no cotton patch. I was patch. born in a damn cotton patch. You put me on. I ain't. I was born in a cotton patch. 20 acres of cotton and a shotgun shack. But you was born in the shack in the cotton patch. Right. Oh, right. It didn't have any windows in it, so you might say I was born in the cotton patch. <laughs> <laughs> were, you, uh, were you folks sharecropping down there? They own the farm? Well, my father was uh, raising cotton for his, well, he's working on his brother's farm. And, uh, kind of sharecropping. I guess he got a little better deal than the average sharecropper. You grew up on the farm down there, the kind of dies. Yeah, I was born in southwest Arkansas on the Cotton Belt Railroad, and um, when I was three years old, my parents moved to northeast Arkansas and lived on a cotton farm there all my life. Were your folks as poor down there as mine was on their cotton patch? I bet you they were. Yeah. 
Yeah, back in the nineteen thirties, that was a poor country. I'm telling you, sure was. My daddy was a was a hobo, you might say. Now, uh, there a lot of people have a misconception of the word a hobo. Uh, they usually think of a hobo as a bum. My father was not a bum. He was he was a hobo in the sense that he hopped the freight trains to go from one part of the country to the other looking for work. And he worked. He worked 10, 12 hours a day cutting pulp wood or whatever kind of work he could get. He sent some money back home to my mother. Did you, uh, did you do any cotton picking down there? Oh, yeah. I picked cotton all my life. Herds, don't it? Sure, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you, you went to school down there, I guess, and, and uh, then you went into the armed services, didn't you? I went into the Air Force in 1950. Spent four years in the Air Force. You didn't, uh, did you do any singing before you went into the service? No, not uh, except around school. And when I was in the Air Force, I didn't, uh, I didn't get in special services. I didn't sing in the Air Force. I was in, I was in security service. When did you decide in security service? Yeah. What's that? That's security service. <laughs> I, I guess the other boys know what you're talking about. I don't really. Uh, when did you decide to start singing, John? Uh, well, as long as I can remember, Bob, I wanted to sing. And when I got out of the Air Force, I started going to Sun Records in Memphis, Tennessee, and finally got an audition, finally got on record. When you was a little boy down in Cotton Pass, did you ever dream back just in your imagination somewhere that you might be on stages throughout the country? Yeah, I did. I always thought I would. By golly, you sure made it. And Sam Phillips at Sun Records uh, put out a record. Your first record was a hit, wasn't it? Well, around... Uh, around the Mid-South Memphis, uh, in that area it was. The record company didn't have very much distribution, so it took a while to to get the records out. The next, my second record was Folsom Prison Blues, and it uh, it went a little bit further. Then I Walked the Line, my third record, is still my biggest seller. I don't guess you've ever really had a flop, not as so far as I know, every record you've ever had has, has done, well, has been what, what most artists would be glad to call the hit. Well, they've paid for the session. <laughs> well, saying it like saying it like this, it sounds like everything has been peaches and cream for you, Johnny no, Cash. No, I wouldn't you, say that. Since you got out of the armed service, I know better. But uh, let's uh, tell us about some of the hard times too, some of the disappointments you've had. What what has been? What was the biggest disappointment you've ever had in all of your life? Well, let me see. The biggest disappointment I had in all my life was the death of my brother Jack when I was 12. He was, a, he was an inspiration to me. Uh, he was a very good boy. He was two years older than I was, and he was killed uh, by an electrical saw, a chainsaw, in a school workshop near my home. Well, that certainly must have been a, a disappointment. And I know that throughout your life, as everybody does, you've probably had a bunch of them. What about your professional life? What's been your biggest disappointment in that? The first royalty statement. <laughs> <laughs> Was it really? I no, I don't, I don't know, Bob. There have been so many good times in, in this business. There have, really haven't been all that many disappointments. Um, I would say the biggest disappointment in my career was playing Carnegie Hall with chronic laryngitis and couldn't sing or talk above a whisper. And this has happened to me quite a bit in the past. I haven't had any voice trouble in a long time, but used to have, I used to have chronic laryngitis for weeks and months at a time. And I'd say that show at Carnegie Hall in New York City was about the biggest disappointment of my career. When were you the most depressed? Uh, was that then, or was it some other time, uh, uh, regardless of what problems you may have had? When were you, have you ever felt like you just like to give it all up and, and get off of this spinning world? No, no, I never have. I never really thought that everybody felt that way one time. Or no, time. I can't ever remember feeling that way, like I'd like to give it up. Uh, I, I, I don't think there's anything could make me want to feel that way, to give it up. I may kill a lot of people, but one of them won't be me. <laughs> <laughs> well, by golly, that, that's pretty good. I, I, anybody, I don't care who he is or how successful he is, has some 
some hard times, and if you remember mostly the good ones, I think that, that's pretty good. Can't help remember the good ones. There have been so many good ones. Johnny, uh, while we're talking, I guess everybody in the country at some time or another read the newspapers or uh, heard on the radio about uh, the trouble you was in down in Texas. Why don't you tell your side of it? I've never heard it. I'm sure nobody has. Well, everybody's heard the rotten bad side. I guess I'll tell a little bit more of the rotten bad side. Okay. Uh, the newspapers said all kinds of things like dope and uh, narcotics and crap like this. There was no such thing. It was not narcotics. It was not dope. It was dexedrine, which comes under the, the dangerous drug and cause dangerous food and cosmetics law. Now, I went to El Paso after a hard tour. I played this SMU Dallas. The next night, it was the end of the tour. Next night, I was dog tired. I felt bad. I went across the border in Mexico and I started drinking beer. And I drank all I could hold. And I decided to, in order to keep feeling good, I would uh, see how many pep pills I could get. Well, I got me a cab driver. I started making the rounds and we got a total of 600, the newspaper said 668. I guess they were right. I don't remember. I was too high. So we got all these and I got to thinking, well, I might need something to kind of relax me after taking all these pills. So I got some tranquilizers. Well, I was so high when I come back across the border. Now, I'm, I'm shooting it to you straight. All right. Well, I was high when I come back across the border. Of course, you would be after take, drinking and taking pills like this. And I wasn't paying any attention to who was watching or anything. Well, it so happens that uh, the Treasury Department men were watching. Well, they thought that possibly I might have heroin or something like this, which I did not. I never never had had anything to do with any, any hard narcotics or anything like that. Well, I thought I had it safe, you know. I thought I really had it made. I went back to the motel, slept it off, and got up to catch the airplane, went out to the airport, and was set down in my seat and they revved up the motors to take off and then they killed the motors and opened the door and those treasury department men came in and asked, I heard them ask, is Johnny Cash on this plane? Well, I thought something might be wrong and the guy and the hostess pointed back to me. Uh, so he started back there and he walked up and he said, you got a gun on you? And I said, no. I said, I've got an antique Colt pistol here in my kit. I said, I collect relics, which it was a relic. It's a Civil War pistol, 1860. And he said, okay, come on, let's get off the plane. I said, wait a minute, you crazy. You're out of your mind. I said, this is a relic. It's, a, it's not a weapon. And he says, he, says uh, he whispered to me, he said, don't cause any trouble. He said, let's get off the plane. He said, you got, you got any narcotics on you? I said, no, I sure don't. He said, you got any pills or anything? I said, yeah got pills. So they took me off the plane, took me into the airport and uh, opened my suitcases. They pulled the suitcases off the plane. They searched my suitcases. They found all these pills. I had them hid, hid in my suitcase and my guitar and everywhere else. And so he said, well, let's, we better go. We've got to go to jail. So, okay. We went to the El Paso County Jail where I spent the night. Got out the next day. A good friend, Neil, married at this jockey on El Paso station, heard about it, he came down and helped get me out. And I went back uh, about six or eight months later, pleaded guilty to a mis misdemeanor, was fined a thousand dollars, and the case was dismissed. Well, that's the first time that I have ever heard the, the complete story like that, and I'm sure it is for everybody that's listening right now, and I'm glad that I asked. John, what, what state are you living in now? Where's where's home? Well, I'm building a home in Na near Nashville, Bob, uh, uh, on Old Hickory Lake. Please, I have a seven and a half acres out on the lake, and I'm building a home there. You lived for a good many years in California. Yes, uh -huh. but uh, you're making your home in Nashville now. Yeah, I'm in the final stages of divorce, and uh, I'll be living in Nashville. We've heard that uh, that you and June Carter plan to get married. Is that right? There may be some truth in that. I mentioned on the radio today that I didn't know, sure, but I thought you all kind of liked each other. Kind of, yeah, kind of attracted to each other, I think. <laughs> well, I'll declare it. Johnny Cash. 
It's been it's been an interesting career that you've had. Uh, I've followed it from from my end as a disc jockey throughout most of those years. Uh, every every record that you've come out has been a, brought out has been a pleasure to play. And uh, of course uh, we got to know each other a long time ago, and I wouldn't take back the experiences we've had together for anything in the world. I think uh, uh, same well, here, Bob. As far as I'm concerned, you're one of the finest people I've met in this business, and one of the people that has helped make this business as great as it is. You know, country music, not what it used to be, John. No, it's not. It, uh, I think it's improving, you know. I think the country music is, is improving greatly. The, the quality of the songs, the quality of the recordings, and uh, some of the best singers are being heard. There's even more to it than that, too. Uh, the, some of the people, like yourself, are putting together shows for personal appearances that are shows now. In the past, uh, so many of the artists would make a record. It, it'd sell pretty good. They'd go out on the personal appearance, get up in front of the microphone, and say, well, here's a little song uh, recorded back in 1934, and they'd sing that. Uh, and do another one like that, but there's no show to it. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. But you have got an integrated show using the Carter family, the Stafford brothers, and and several others. That is a show from beginning to end, a professional show that any person <clears throat> would never have to be ashamed to bring his mother-in-law to or his most important business associate. This sort of thing is reasonably new in our business. Uh, over the last four Well, Bob, uh, the shows have got to improve or the business is dead. Now, we, we get out, we do a clean show. No matter how rotten I may be on the side, we do a clean show. <laughs> then uh, that, that old dirty underwear joke just ain't going to go year after year after year. You know, you got to get out and you got to sing these people. You got to try to entertain them. And uh, the, I could see it myself that the business was... It was going to fall flat on its butt if somebody didn't get out and do a, and try to, to do a show. And the, in turn, this is going to spark this next artist that comes along to improve his show. And uh, I think the best talent, the best songs, the best music, and the best performers, the best potential performers in any kind of music are in country music. If they get out there and let the people hear what they got to, like, got to produce. Because this is the grassroots of the business industry, the country music, the, the backbone of the music industry, of all music, is the, is the love song, the ballad. And the best ones come from the soul, come from the heart. And that's the country music singers. Well, that's very true, and they're going to have to learn, as you say, to present it professionally so that it is a professional show. And it's not just the artists. The same thing is true with the radio station. Right. Play country and western music, and I've been... I've been doing this all through the, the Cousin Jake and the Aunt Louise days from 15 and 20 years ago uh, when it was called Hillbilly Music. And you got an old boy on there that talked as funny as I do now, and he would tell about the corniest jokes and say, all you folks out there in Radio Land, and this has been the case up until just a few years ago. But now country music is really coming into its own. We have... Uh, radio stations with professional men at the microphone who, who know radio and hopefully who know right. country music and can put them together and they're being successful throughout the country. Quite often, as with our own station here in Seattle, we're getting to be number one in the ratings. And just a few years ago, this was unheard of. With the country. Mm -hmm. So it has grown. It's grown tremendously because uh, it, it's, it's worthy of growing. The records themselves are coming out better and better with more professional arrangements, a little more polished, and yet they still retain that basic, earthy country quality right. that has hung on throughout the years. If country music didn't have something at heart, it would have died out 15 right. years ago, right. when it really didn't have anything going for it but that, the thing that could appeal to another person's heart. Right. If we can keep that and do it more professionally than we have in the past, it's just going to keep on growing. People ask me, why why do you take a song like Ring of Fire and put, put trumpets on it, of all things? Why use brass while you're trying to be pop or something? Now, this is the most, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. If you can take a song and dress it up, not to make it phony and something that is not, but dress it up and arrange it 
intelligently starting to appeal to a bigger mass of the people. So it's, it doesn't take it out of the country field. It's still a country song, but it's got the polish, it's got the appeal, the sound of appeal to appeal to more people. Now, you, I could have done Ring of Fire with a fiddle and a steel guitar, and uh, this would have limited the appeal. We, yet we took a country song and we arranged it sensibly with, with brass, with the trumpets, and this song has sold a million records. But it's still a country song. It's still a brass country didn't song. take that away from right. it. Bob Wills had brass in his band right. uh, back where? Back in the 1930s, I guess. Right. How much more uh, country and western, western swing, <laughs> we called it, can you get? Right. He's one of the pioneers in the business. Jimmy Rogers, some of the first records he ever made in the 1927, used pr a trumpet. Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong on a trumpet, and in that day, he sold more records than anything they had going. I know that for a fact. I've got all his royalty statements. Is that right? Yeah. Hey, I have everything uh, Jimmy Rogers uh, ever had, I suppose. Mrs. Rogers gave it all to me. I have the rights to do his life story and film, you know. Well, that must really be an honor. And I have, uh, I have all of his royalty statements from the very first. You know, this guy in 1930 was selling a half million records on every single. Now this is this is almost unbelievable. People just didn't have record players, you know. In 1930, that is unbelievable. You know, that's 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 all well, good I can, nowadays. I, that's right. I can prove that. I've got the royalty statements. Uh, I, I have heard stories of how the uh, the big shots of that day. You know, the record industry was very new at that time. It was a new thing. Nobody hardly knew what they were doing. So naturally, they knew they had a new product, so the first thing they did was hire great big symphony orchestras to come in and record, you know, make records, and they put them out to sell. And they could not believe that Jimmy Rogers could stand up and just him and his guitar and yodel a little and outsell all these 30 and 40 piece orchestras. Mm -hmm. And I, I've, I've had many a chuckle over that because I can just visualize them thinking, my, my God, here's, here's this hillbilly singing by himself, and he's out selling the best that we can do down here. But it was country music. He knew what he was doing. Yeah. He was singing from the heart to the heart. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing that we got to keep as we get professional with better arrangements. we still got to keep that or it won't be country right. music. This is why uh, a lot of the pop artists who record country songs, some of them do fairly well. Some others don't because they don't really know what they're doing. They're, they're singing mm -hmm. the songs, but it don't mean anything to them. Right. And the people, you can't fool the people, they know. Absolutely. This, they are listening to us right now, or a number of people who love country music. You can't fool them. They no. either going to like it or they don't like it. And if they like it, it's country music. And if they don't like it, it isn't. So that's what, of course, you can't please everybody. I didn't mean to say that. There'd be two, two buddies sitting side by side, and one of them will like Johnny Cash, and one of them will like Eddie Arnold. Mm -hmm. But it's still, you know, it's still country music. They both like country right. music. So oh, I, I think it's got a much greater future than, than it's had a past, and it's had rather a distinctive past. Right. Johnny, what do you think about uh, uh, our new class of hippies over here, our draft card burners and, and, and et cetera? What, what's your feelings on it? I think they're a bunch of punks. <laughs> I think they're a bunch of un-American punks. I think they belong on the other side North Vietnam with the odds against them. <laughs> well, I'll have to admit that's just about my feelings, too. I served my time in the Air Force. I wasn't in Vietnam. I wasn't in combat, but I was ready to go. I, and I'm still ready to go if I had to. And um, if I was on the front line, I would like for the draft card burners to be on the front line on the other side <laughs> because these guys infuriate me to no end. I can't stand the long-haired beatniks that, that march and, and wave their protest signs up and down the street. And if I ever get a chance, I'm going to tear into them right in the middle of the street. Well, that's just about my feelings exactly, and I rather imagine they're shared by most of the boys listening to us right now. They're actually, they make, they make the newspapers and stuff like that a lot more than what they deserve. I, I don't mean, think they, they deserve a damn line in the news. Uh, there, there's, uh, there's not that many of them, nor are they that newsworthy. No. And there, there's a few long-haired, mostly uneducated. 
You know, I've seen the writings of some of these people here at the university. Uh, and they got up, uh, some little stories they sent out to our radio station claiming uh, police brutality and all that sort of thing, you know. Mm-hmm. I was amazed. These people are hanging around the university, but they don't go to school there. They, no. they write on a third grade level. Honest to God, they can't spell, they can't form a sentence, uh, and what they're doing, I, I don't really know. But so much more has been made out of them than, than what they, they really are. There's not that many of them, or they carry any weight with anybody. But they're I, is, they're is strictly un-American. Uh, the, the, the Americans are, are over here in Vietnam, let's face it, the, the American boys that are that have got their rifles cocked and ready to defend these punks back in the United States that are writing these letters to you and to the other stations and are out there protesting. Boy, it thrills me to death to see these guys when they're protesting for somebody to just come up and just kick their butts or knock the hell out of them. Just, uh, it's, it just infuriates me to no end. I want to get right in there with them, against them. Well, that's the way I, I figure they're just as much the enemy as the guys as the Viet Cong are. I swear I do. I think they're just as much the enemy as the Viet Cong. Yeah. Well, change the subject, John. Uh, what are your plans now? Just keep on keeping on? Yeah, keep on keeping on. We'll probably get around to Vietnam eventually. I don't know. We, uh, we're supposed to go back to the Far East on another tour and uh, to Taiwan and Maybe the Philippines, and if we do, if we get that far, we'll get to Vietnam on tour. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of people... I'd like to take this show. I'd like to take this show, the Carter family and the Stadler brothers and Carl Perkins and myself to to Vietnam. Well, it sure is a fabulous show. You've had an interesting life, John, an interesting career. I think you deserve all of the good things that uh, that have happened to you and all the success that you have. and I sincerely believe that you will have and deserve much more success in the future. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Johnny Cash. Okay, everyone, I hope you enjoyed hearing that interview. It's such a privilege to feel like we're sitting in the room with such historical figures like it was yesterday. We have such access to recording devices today that it's easy to forget there was a time when having such a recording was a rare and novel thing. In future installments in this series, I intend to share lost interviews of the Statler brothers and the Carter family, including Mother Maybell Carter. Until then, please hit subscribe, and y'all take care.